Hey everyone, welcome to Sums of Anarchy Let's Solve. This is the final video in a four part series where we've been working our way through the November 2021 Edexcel non calculator higher tier maths paper. I'll pop a link to the paper in the description as well as links to the other three videos. So we're finishing off the paper all the way up to question 22. Let's go. Okay, question 17. On the grid, show by shading the region that satisfies all of these inequalities. So we've got 2y plus 4 is less than x, x is less than 3, and y is less than 6 minus 3x. Okie dokie. So I'm going to write those at the side so we can zoom in here a little bit. So we've got 2y plus 4 is less than x. Let's write x is less than 3 down here and over here we'll go y less than 6 minus 3x. Okay, let's zoom in a bit. Alright, let's start with the easiest one. So, x is less than 3. Now, the line x equals 3 would be here, but we're going to draw a dotted line because x doesn't equal 3, it's everything less than 3. So what that would represent is everything to the left of that dotted line. Okie dokie, so that's that one sorted. All right, let's try this one over here. Y is less than 6 minus 3x. So I'm just going to rearrange that a minute. So Y is less than minus 3x plus 6. Okay, I'm going to plot it as though it was y equals minus 3x plus 6. So the y-intercept comes at 0, 6, so that's the point where x would be 0. I could plug that in and get that y would be 6. So it's going to cross the axis here. Now, it's got a gradient of minus 3. That means that for every 1 we move to the right, we have to move 1, 2, 3 down. Every 1 we move to the right, 1, 2, 3 down. I could also plug in values of x. So I could, for example, say, well, what happens when x equals 2? 2 times minus 3 is minus 6. Minus 6 plus 6 is 0. So when x equals 2, y is 0. So whichever way we want to do this, I'm going to carry on with my 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3. OK, so now I need to join this up with a line. I don't have a ruler, so I'm just going to use this, but you will use a ruler. So let's make sure that it goes through all the points. Again, it's a dotted line because y isn't equal to minus 3x plus 6. It is less than. So it's going to be everything below this line. OK, that looks about right for that. OK, and the final one over here, I'm going to rearrange this so I've got something that looks more like y equals because that's easier to plot. So first of all, I've got 2y. I'm going to subtract 4 from each side. So I'm going to have 2y is less than x minus 4. And then I need to divide by that 2, so I'm left with y on this side. And if I divide everything by 2 on the other side, I've got half x minus 2. OK, so now I'm going to plot, I'm going to actually plot y equals half x minus 2, but I'm going to do it with a dotted line because it isn't equal, it's less than. So in the same way, I can find out that my y-intercept is going to be at minus 2, because if I put in x is 0, that first term is going to be 0, minus 2, that means y is minus 2. OK, so now I've got a gradient of half x. That means for every one space I move to the right, I move half up. One space to the right, half up. One space to the right, half up. One space to the right, half up. I could also just plug in values for x. So for example, if I take x equals 4 and plug that in here, 4 divided by 2 is 2. 2 to take away 2 is 0, so the y, y coordinate will be 0. But let's just carry on plotting a few more points. So again, I'm going to go one to the left and down half. It's going to look something like this. OK, so now I need another line to join up these dots. Again, you will use your ruler. But let's fashion it like this. That looks about right there. OK, that looks about right. OK, so again, we've used a dotted line because it's not y equals half x minus 2, it's y is less than. So now I've got to shade the region that's less than. So we said that for this first line here, x was less than 3, so it's going to be to the left of that line. For this line here, that was our y is less than 6x. 6 minus 3x, again, it's going to be below that line. And for the final line, the orange line, y is going to be less than that. So it's going to be below. That means that our area to shade here is the one bound 
by all three lines here. You don't need to draw that in, I'm just showing you. So it's clear and they want us to label that R. There is R. Okay, question 18. Here is trapezium A, B, C, D. The area of the trapezium is 66 centimetres squared. The length of A, B, or the ratio of the length of A, B to the length of C, D is 2 to 3. We need to find the length of A, B. So we need to start off with our formula for the area of a trapezium. So the area of a trapezium is given by half of the sum of the parallel lines, so we'll call those A and B, multiplied by the perpendicular height. So that's going to be this one here. So we'll just mark that H. So this is our area. So we know that that is 66 centimetres squared. So let's replace that A with a 66. Okay, so now we need to fill in a bit more information. The first thing we need to discover is the height of this value h. So what we've actually done here is we've made a right angle triangle. So that should be ringing some trigonometry alarm bells. And let's have a look. So we've got, let's pull out this right angle triangle down here. We have a 30 degree angle, an opposite and a hypotenuse of six. So hopefully you remember that some owls have cheese and ham to offer aardvarks or whatever memory tool you like to use to remember that. So this reminds us that sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse and that's what we've got here. We have an opposite and a hypotenuse. So we're looking at sine of 30. So the other thing that you will want to have memorized to be able to do this is the sine 30 triangle. So that looks something like this. This is our 30 degree angle. This one would be the 60. This is one, this is square root of three and the hypotenuse is two. So the sine of 30 is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So sine 30 is a half. Okay, so once we've got that, we can go back to our actual triangle here and see if we can work out what the height is. Okay, so if we know that the sine of 30 is a half, but in this case, the sine of 30 is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So that is h over six, and that has got to be equal to a half because we know that sine of 30 is a half. So we need to just solve for h. So on the left-hand side, we've divided by six. The opposite of dividing by six is multiplying by six. So let's do that to both sides. That's gonna leave h on its own on the left. And we're gonna have a half times six. Half times six is three. So now we know that the height of our parallelogram is three. Let's mark that in. Okay, we're making some progress. We can also mark that in here. So we've got half A plus B multiplied by three. Okay, so next up we want to fill in the lengths of A, B and C, D. We've just called them A and B so far. Those are our parallel sides here. So it has told us that the length of A, B to the length of C, D is in the ratio two parts to three parts. Now we don't know what a part is worth, but whenever we don't know something, we can just call it X. So let's say that A, B is two X and CD is 3x. Okay, so now we can replace that in our formula in place of A plus B. So we've got half multiplied by 2x plus 3x, that's the length that we've designated our parallel sides, multiplied by the height that we've got is three. Okay, let's tidy this up a bit. So 2x plus 3x is 5x, so we've got a half times 5x, multiplied by three. Now remember this is all equal to 66. I'll just bring that 66 down here so we can see it. Okay, now we wanna find out what X equals. So we need to get X on its own somehow. So let's work our way into the X. So the first thing we've got is we've got a multiply by three on the right hand side. The opposite of multiplying by three is divide by three. So let's divide both sides by three. On the left hand side, we're gonna end up with 22. And on the right hand side, that's just gonna get rid of that times three. The next thing we've got is we've got multiplied by half. So multiplying by half is the same as dividing by two. The opposite of that is multiplying by two. So if we multiply both sides by two, we'll have 44 on the left and we'll eliminate that half, leaving just five X. 
Okie dokie, so finally it's an x multiplied by 5, the opposite of multiplying by 5 is dividing by 5. So let's divide both sides by 5 and we'll end up with 44 divided by 5 equals just x. But 44 over 5 doesn't sound very sensible for a length, so we best just work that out. We can do a bit of long division. 44 divided by 5. 5 goes into 44 eight times. We need a decimal. Remainder 4. And 5 goes into 48 times. Okie dokie. So x is, I'm going to just change that around, x is 8.8. .8. But we don't want x, do we? We want 2x because we want the length of AB. So if x is 8.8, .8, then 2x is going to be 8.8 .8 times 2, which is going to be 17.6. Okay, question 19. Show that 8 plus the square root of 12 over 5 plus the square root of 3 can be written in the form a plus the square root of 3 over b, where a and b are integers. So remember, we don't need to get too upset about this. a and b are just going to stand for some counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, that we now have to find out. And the way that we're going to find them is by a process called rationalizing the denominator. Now, first things first, if you see the square root of a number, have a look and see if you can find any square numbers that are factors of that number because you can already simplify it. So for example, this square root of 12, now 12 is the same as four times three, four is a square number. That means the square root of 12 is the same as the square root of four times three. I can separate those into the square root of four times the square root of three and now we see why it was handy that we found a square number because I can take the square root of four to give me two times that root three to root three. Okay so we've simplified the square root of 12 to two root three. So let's write this out with that in mind. So we've got eight plus two root three over five plus root three. And now we want to rationalize the denominator. We want to get rid of this third from the denominator. How do we do that? Well, if we've got five plus root three in the denominator, what we want to multiply by is five minus root three. We take the same number in the same third and we flip the sign and that's going to eliminate the third as we'll see in a minute. But if we multiply the denominator by five minus root three, we're going to need to multiply the numerator by five minus root three as well. Okay. So let's expand out these brackets. So again, we can use the FOIL technique. We'll multiply the first terms, the outside terms, the inside terms, and then the last terms. And we're gonna have to do that twice through for the numerator and the denominator. So first up, we've got first terms, eight times five is 40. Now outside terms, eight times the minus the square root of three is gonna be minus eight square root three. A positive two root three times five is gonna give a positive 10 root 3 and finally 2 root 3 times a negative root 3 well let's just have a look at this separately down here I'll just do it in a different color so we've got 2 root 3 multiplied by I'm going to just ignore the negative for a second we'll put it out here to know, so we know it's coming multiplied by a root 3 now if we multiply root 3 by itself we're just going to get 3 so then we've got 2 times three, which is six. And then we've got that negative, so it's gonna be a minus six. So two root three times a negative root three is just gonna give us a minus six. And that's the numerator taken care of. Let's now work our way through the denominator. So again, we'll start with the first terms. Five times five is 25. The outside terms, five times a negative root three is gonna be a negative five root three. Now we've got a positive root three times five. That's gonna be a positive five root three. Maybe you can see where our thirds are gonna cancel out in a minute. And finally, the last terms, we're gonna multiply a root three by a negative root three. That's gonna give us just a negative three. Okie dokie, so we can do a bit of tidying up here. So in our numerator, Let's combine the normal numbers. So we've got 40 minus six, that's gonna give us 34. And then we've got minus eight root three plus 10 root three, that's gonna give us a positive two root three. And then in the denominator, the whole numbers are gonna be 25 minus three, that's gonna be 22. And the minus five root three plus the five root three is gonna cancel out to nothing. So now we've got no thirds in the denominator. We have rationalized the denominator. I don't know why I left 
such a space there. Let's move that over. 22. Okay, so we're close, but we've got A and B as our integers, but we've actually got three whole numbers here, and that's because there's one more step we need to do for full marks. We need to cancel. So what can we cancel? We can take out a factor of two. We can divide all of these whole numbers by two. We're going to be left with 17 plus root three over 11. Now that does look like the form we were asked for, where A and B are 17 and 11. Okay, question 20. The diagram shows the graph of x squared plus y squared equals 30.25. Use the graph to find estimates for the solutions of the simultaneous equations, x squared plus y squared equals 30.25, and y minus 2x equals 1. Okay, so the solutions of the equations are going to come at the points where those two graphs intersect. So luckily, they've drawn the x squared plus y squared equals 30.25 graph for us, and we just have to draw the other one and find out the points where they intersect. So let's do that. So we've got y minus 2x equals 1. I'm going to rearrange that so it's just got the y on its own because that's easy to plot. So I need to add 2x to both sides. That's going to give me y equals 2x plus 1. Okay, so now I can see that my, let's zoom in a little bit to this graph, that my y intercept is at 1 and my gradient is 2. So for every one place I go to the right, I need to go up two. One to the right, up two. One to the right, up two. And the same going left. One to the left, down two. One to the left, down two. Down two. One to the left, down two. All right, that should do it. Now, you will obviously have a ruler to join up these points. I'm going to use a line I prepared earlier. Okay. All right, so that looks about right. So now, to find the solutions of these equations, I need to look for the points where the two graphs intersect. So let's have a look at those. I'm just gonna rub out my point there because it looks a little bit close to the circle, and let's take a look. Okay, so this point here, I can follow that down for my x coordinate, which is gonna be here, and my y coordinate, which is gonna be here. Now I can see that each square is worth 0.2, so my x coordinate is going to be 2.1 and my y coordinate is going to be 5.1. So that's my first set of solutions x, y equals 2.1 and 5.1. And my second set is down here, so I can follow this up to the x axis that looks like 2.9 minus 2.9, and to the y axis it's going to be minus 4.7, minus 2.9, minus 4.7. Now, your answers might be slightly differently depending on where your line ended up, but make sure you use a sharp pencil, and I think they'll probably give you a lenience of about 0.1 or 2 either side. Okay, question 21. The functions f and g are such that f of x equals 3x squared plus 1 for x greater than 0, and g of x is 4 divided by x squared, also for x greater than 0. Work out g of f of 1. Okay, so with a function like this, we need to work our way backwards. So what this is going to be is g of the function f at x equals 1. So let's start by working out f of 1. Well, f of 1 is going to be 3 times 1 squared plus 1, because we're putting in 1 as x. Well, 1 squared is 1, times 3 is 3, plus 1 gives 4. So f of 1 is 4. So now we need to plug that in to g, and we'll find g of 4, which is 4 over 4 squared, which is 16, and we can cancel this down to be 1 over 4. Okay, the function h is such that h is fg to the minus 1, so that's an inverse function. So an inverse function is one that takes us back, it undoes whatever we've done. So we've done something and we do an inverse fact function, it takes us back to where we started. So let's have a look through this. So first of all, let's find out what the function fg of x is going to look like. So again, we work our way outwards from the x, so we do g first and then f. So where are our functions? Okay, so we're gonna put in four over x squared into our function f. So we're gonna end up with three 
multiplied by 4 over x squared squared plus 1 plus one. Okay, great. So that's our function fg of x. So let's expand this out and see where we get to. So first we need to square four over x squared. So we're going to get 16 over x to the power of four plus one. And then we can multiply by that three. So we're going to get 48 over x to the power of four plus one. So that is the function fg, but we want to find the inverse of that. So we need to find the function that undoes this. Okay, so what we're going to do is firstly, we're going to, instead of fg of x, we're going to call this y. We're going to say y equals 48 over x to the power of 4 plus 1. Now we're going to switch over x and y. So we're going to write x equals 48 over y to the power of 4 plus 1. And now we're going to rearrange this so we have y as the subject of the formula. So we're going to have y equals something. So let's set about doing that. So the first thing we can do is we can subtract 1 from both sides. So that's going to give us x minus 1 on the left. And it's just going to leave us with 48 over y to the power of 4 on the right. OK, the next thing we can do is multiply by y to the power of 4. That's going to get rid of this denominator. So that's going to bring this over here. So we're going to end up y to the power of 4 times by x minus 1, and that's just going to equal 48. OK, and now we've got y to the power of 4 multiplied by x minus 1. The opposite of that would be dividing by x minus 1. If I do that to both sides, I'll end up with y to the power of 4 on its own is 48 over x minus 1. OK, this is looking good. We are nearly there. The last step is to take the fourth root because that will leave us with just a y. And if I take the fourth root on that side, I've got to take the fourth root on this side of 48 over x minus 1. So now I can substitute back instead of y. This is going to be our function of x and we called it h of x. So h of x equals the fourth root of 48 over x minus 1. OK, question 22. Find the coordinates of the turning point on the curve with equation y equals 9 plus 18x minus 3x squared. So this is a quadratic graph. So this looks like a, a parabola, a u-shaped graph. So it's either going to be something like this or something like this. And the turning point is going to be the point at which it changes direction. So for example, if it was a car going up a hill, the turning point is the point at which it then goes down the hill. If it was like this, maybe it's a skateboarder going into the bolt. And when he hits the bottom, he turns and goes back up the bowl. So those are the turning points. They're either the top point or the bottom point. So how do we do this? Well, we have to complete the square. So let's rearrange this a little bit. So we've got y equals minus 3x squared plus 18x plus 9. OK, now I'm going to factorise uh, minus 3. I'm going to pull out a minus 3 from every term and see what's left. So in the first term, I'd have to multiply by x squared to make that term again. In the second term, I would have to multiply by minus 6 because minus 3 times minus 6x would give me plus 18x. And in the final term, I'd have to multiply by a minus 3 because minus 3 times minus 3 would give positive 9. OK, so now I want to complete the square on this x squared minus 6x minus 3. So I'm just going to do it separately down here for a second. OK, so what we do is we halve the x coefficient. So that's going to be 3. So we write out x minus 3 all squared. Now let's see how that helps. Let's just expand this out for a second. We would have x squared minus 6x plus 9. OK, so if I want this expression that we've got, x squared minus 6x minus 3, to equal x squared minus 6x plus 9, plus what else do I have to do to get to minus 3? To go from plus 9 to minus 3, I have to minus a 12. OK, so now I know that this part here can be replaced with x minus 3 squared and that is how we complete the square 
x minus 3 squared minus 12. And I know it's going to be equal to x squared minus 6 minus 3. So I'm going to replace that up here, x minus 3 squared minus 12. So I'm going to take this minus 3 out, I'm going to put it in square brackets, x minus 3 squared minus 12. Okay, now I can multiply this minus 3 by everything in the middle, so I've got minus 3 times by x minus 3 squared, and then minus 3 times minus 12 is going to give us a positive 36. Okay, so my turning points are going to happen, or my turning point rather, is going to happen when this part is zero. What part does that become zero at? Well, x equals three would make that zero because three minus three would give us zero. Zero squared is still zero. Zero times minus three is still zero. So my x coordinate is going to be three. And if all of this becomes zero, then I'm left with a y coordinate of 36. So we can just take a quick look at a sketch of this parabola. Now that we've got it in this form, it's gonna be easier to sketch it. Okay, so we know that we start with the parabola y equals x squared, which looks something like this, and then it undergoes some transformations. So the first transformation was that we did x minus three. So what that does is it, trans it moves the parabola three places to the right. So that's gonna be about here somewhere. And then we added this 36, so that's gonna send it up 36. So maybe around here somewhere. And then we multiplied by minus three. So what that's gonna do is firstly, it's gonna turn it upside down. And secondly, it's gonna stretch it out like this. So we can see that, yeah, roughly our turning point is gonna be at 336. All right, excellent work. That is the whole paper in the bag. I really hope you enjoyed this series. Let us know if you did by hitting the like button. If you've got any questions at all, drop those in the comments and we'll do our best to answer them. If you'd like to see more videos like this, let us know if there's a specific paper you want to see answered or any specific questions you'd like to go into more detail about. Let us know about that in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel at Sums of Anarchy for more maths tips and tricks. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next one. See you later.